Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for each person who has gathered here today. Father, I just pray that your spirit would meet us in this space, meet those who are watching online. God, give me the words to speak and open up the ears and the hearts of those who need to hear it today. Lord, we pray this in your son's precious and holy name. And all God's people said... Well, after two years of trying to avoid it, like Neo in the Matrix avoiding bullets, uh, trying to avoid getting COVID, COVID finally hit my house in the last two weeks. And uh, that meant I got to spend a lot of time at home. Now, everybody's back to being healthy. I never got it, but because I never got it and was exposed, I'm having to go back to one of these for a few more days per our staff policy. Let me tell you, after you haven't worn a mask in a while, putting it back on is hard. Um, So I got to spend uh, some extra time at home, and Ava, my six-year-old, loved that daddy was home. She wanted daddy-daughter time. Lots and lots of daddy-daughter time for a little girl who gets bored very quickly. And so uh, last weekend, daddy, let's do something together. I don't know what to do. What do you want to do? I don't know. Okay, let's Google it. So I Googled things to do in the house. And I pulled up an article, and I started listing things that we could do together. Oh, do you want to do this? No, I don't want to do that. Oh, do you want to do this? No, we've already done that. I skipped a few that it was not on the table for me at all. Um, And then I got to one. It said, bake cookies. And she said, yeah, Daddy, let's do that. Friends, I haven't baked, and I cannot tell you when. But I said, okay, let's go do that. So I Googled a recipe for sugar cookies. I'm thinking, these, these are simple, right? I love sugar cookies. They can't be that hard to make. <laughs> um, so I get this recipe, and I go into the kitchen, and I start pulling out the ingredients. I grab the sugar, I grab the flour, I grab the baking soda, the baking powder, the vanilla extract, the, the egg, and the butter. And I didn't really read the directions all that closely, and I just threw it all in the bowl, and we started mixing it together. There's apparently a process to this, and I skipped it. Um, so we're, we're mixing this together. Ava's helping me, and it comes time to put the, the cookie dough into on, on, the, on the pan. And it's just really mushy. Like, I'm taking globs of mush and putting it onto the cookie sheet. It should have told me something. Uh, so I, I, we put it in the oven, and I turned the light on so we could watch it. And by this point, Amy has woken up from a nap. And so I go into the room, and I was like... So as far as the ingredients, the two unmarked plastic containers that were in the uh, pantry, one was sugar and one was flour, right? She said, no, one was sugar and one was powdered sugar. And I went, oh, no. <laughs> While I didn't read all of the directions, I did make sure to put the appropriate amounts of things in the, into the, the cookie dough. And so I put one cup of sugar and two and a half cups of what I thought was flour what was powdered sugar, hence why it was nothing but mush. So I ran into the kitchen and pulled this hot tray out that was just all liquid. It was just a big puddle of liquid in the oven. So I put it up on top of the stove and I get the, the flour I found. Oh, we have actual thing that says flour. And it says self-rising flour. Thought that was redundant. Apparently not. I'll get to that in a moment. So I take two and a half cups and I just throw it on top of the cookie pan. And the last service said that too. Apparently, I really don't know how to bake. (laughs) So I start just mushing it with my hands into the flour in this mush. And it it, it actually starts turning into cookie dough the way I you would think it's supposed to look like. And so I I pushed it together and I don't know what you call them, but it looked like patties. And I gave each each cookie some space to grow. Get a little, little space on the cookie sheet. Put it back in the oven. Did I say it was self-rising flour? Yeah, I don't know what kind of super flour my wife had bought. The cookies that I made were about this big. It was like something out of a sitcom. I'm watching it through the window of the oven and they keep getting bigger and bigger and puffier, and before I know it, the whole pan is one big cookie <laughs> with little blobs everywhere. And I, I, I took a toothpick to see if it was done, and I poked one in the center and went poof <laughs> and settled back down because the inside, all of that powdered sugar just wasn't congealing. It, was, it wasn't getting firm. And so I ended up having to leave it in the oven for three times the length that the recipe called for 
Finally, I just called it. I said, it's going to be what it is. I pulled it out, put it on top. Ava looked at me, six years old, goes, I don't know if that's edible. <laughs> Friends, I made the ugliest sugar cookies imaginable. You know, you ever heard the phrase, don't judge a book by its cover? You ever heard that phrase? I've, I've done that before. I, uh, when I was actually around six years old, I remember going to a used bookstore with my mom. And I, I found a book. It had Mickey Mouse on the cover. Somebody had recovered a book with Mickey Mouse paper. And I, I brought it to the desk to check out. And uh, my mom's like, son, that, that's not a children's book. I'm like, yeah, it is. It's got Mickey Mouse on the front of it. And she let me buy it as a lesson. Turns out it was a used math textbook. <laughs> don't judge a book by its cover and don't judge a cookie until you try it. I made amazing cookies. It turned out really well. Now, after about one of them, you go into a diabetic coma because it's got like three and a half cups of sugar in it, but it was really good. Just looked terrible. But I tell you all this to make this statement. Don't judge someone for where they are right now. Friends, God is working in people's lives in ways that you cannot even see nor comprehend. And only God knows what the end result's gonna be. The process for that person to become the one that God is crafting them to be is often messier than we would expect. And we tend to judge people in the midst of their mess. You know, we are now into week eight of this sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount. The greatest sermon ever out of Matthew chapter five, six, and seven. And we are now to the point where Jesus says this, Matthew chapter seven, starting verse one. He says, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all of the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So Jesus addresses this in this sermon because he knows that judging other people comes so naturally. It's, it's a part of our human nature. Judgment or, or condemnation, same, same idea that he's talking about in this passage. It, it comes from a point of us wanting or needing to feel better or superior to someone else. And as humans, we tend to do this all of the time. We rank people. Well, I'm better than this group of people. Maybe not as good as this group over here, but I know I'm certainly farther along than this motley crew. We, we tend to do this and it comes ever so naturally to us. But something that we have to understand and something we have to push back on in our culture is the idea that just because it is natural for us, that somehow everything that is natural is good or right. We live in a culture that is telling us increasingly all of the time that to live your best life, you need to do whatever comes naturally to you. But the problem with that is that it denies the understanding of original sin, that each one of us is born naturally sinful. So therefore, not everything that we feel, think, or experience is good, right, and true because we were corrupted from the very beginning in our sinful nature. But judging one another... It comes naturally to us, but Jesus says we must push past what comes naturally to pursue a greater depth of loving our neighbor. Because guess what? Loving your neighbor isn't natural. Not the way Jesus calls us to do it. Now, Jesus is clear with how we as his followers are to act. Yet, how many of us have ever run into judgmental Christians? Yeah. I won't ask for show of hands, but how many of us have ever been judgmental Christians? Yeah. But it ought not be that way, right? You know, we've not been appointed to be the morality police citing people for all of their, their wrongdoings. Instead, what Jesus has told us in this sermon up to this point is that we are called to be light in darkness, to be the beacons of hope for people who are floundering their way through life, to be salt that preserves those whom we are around. That's what we're called to do. 
And Jesus even it models for us the posture we are to take towards people. Jesus never condoned people's sins, but he never beat them up over it either. In fact, the people that he got onto the most for their sins were the, the hypocritical religious leaders who thought themselves to be much greater and better than everybody else. That's who he chewed out. But I think, I think Jesus takes this approach because he knows every person that we encounter is a work in progress. And therefore, if we are a work in progress, don't even pretend to think that we know what somebody's been through. Or pretend to think that we know what somebody's going through. Or pretend to think what we know the outcome in that person's life will be. You know, God isn't done with a single person that you are tempted to judge. Just as God is not done with each one of you. Friends, God is not done addressing the mess in your life. Thanks be to God. Now in verses three, for three through five, Jesus tells us that before you point out another person's sin, you first got to take care of your own. He uses this example of uh, before you try to get that speck of sawdust out of the other person's eye, you might want to address the plank, the two by four that is just Sitting right there, you, you, you need to address this before you get to that. Now, Jesus often uses uh, extreme analogies to highlight faulty logic. And then he lets you draw the conclusion yourself. But he says, man, before you start pointing the finger and, and calling out other people's mistakes and sins and failures, man, you got to turn inward. You got to address the junk that's in here before you can ever look at somebody else and pass judgment. But he does say, in whatever judgment you deal out, you will get in return. This is the biblical equivalent of what goes around. Yeah. If you don't want people doing it to you, you might not want to do it to them. Now, is it any coincidence that Jesus says that both forgiveness and judgment are reciprocal? Within the same sermon, now we've broken it up over all these weeks, but remember Jesus has given this one sermon. It, in one period of time, it would have taken about 20, 22 minutes to give it. In the same sermon where he says, you will be forgiven to the measure that you forgive other people, that he says, you will be judged in the same measure you judge other people. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with the Lord of the Rings, but... In this great epic tale by J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, there's this great interaction between Gandalf the wizard and Frodo the hobbit. Frodo has been tasked to carry this ring of power to Mordor to destroy it that represents all the evil in the world. And it's this great epic journey. It's, uh, and, and Gandalf's there to lead him uh, on it, at least in the beginning. Uh, and in this early part of the story, they're being stalked by the, the antagonist, a creature named Gollum. Who wants that ring for himself. And Frodo has no love for Gollum. In fact, he wishes that Gollum was dead for all the things that Gollum has done up to this point in the story. And Gandalf very wisely says this. He says, many that live deserve death and some that die deserve life. Can you give it to them? Then do not be too eager to deal out death and judgment. Don't be so eager to pass judgment on somebody else. If you know the rest of the story, you know that Gollum is the only reason that Frodo is able to accomplish his task and to, and to destroy the ring. And had he passed the judgment and gotten his wish, the rest of the story wouldn't have happened. You know, when we pass judgment on someone, we fail to acknowledge that God is still at work in that person's life. We've passed judgment on people in the midst of their mess but we deny the fact that God is working in that mess. Now, in the very end of chapter 6, so the, this, this part of the sermon's chapter 7. At the very end of chapter 6, Jesus has just said, Instead, desire first and foremost God's kingdom and God's righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. It is hard to stay focused on God, God's kingdom, and the people that God loves, and still point out everybody else's faults. It's really hard to have your eyes on him and point fingers to everybody else. Now, the 
question is, where does this passage lie in relationship to Christian accountability? Because you and I as Christians should hold each other accountable. Paul even says this in, in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He says, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. Paul says, stop judging the people outside the church. That's God's job. Don't be surprised when non-Christian people act like non-Christians. But for those of us, we should hold each other accountable to our faith. Now, Paul is specifically writing this to a church that's dealing with the fact that one of their members is having a relationship, an active relationship with his stepmom. And nobody's saying anything about it. Paul's like, yep, feel free to call that guy out. That's appropriate. But there's a difference between judging and accountability. And that, I think, is what Paul is making the distinction here. But it's not for us to judge other people, especially those who don't know Jesus. Don't be surprised when non-Christian people act like non-Christians. But that statement is not a license to let people do whatever they want or for you to do whatever you want. But it is, instead, gives us the freedom to love everyone despite their actions or despite their circumstance. Now, I believe people are accountable for their actions. But as the older I get, the more life experience I have, the more I realize that people's actions are often influenced by external factors. Like their parents their upbringing, like abuse or trauma, like divorce or addiction, these, these painful things that shape us and cause us to act out in certain ways and make certain life decisions. You just don't know what a person has gone through and never assume that you know. And that's what judgment does. It assumes knowledge that you don't necessarily have. So in Tyler, in our last house, there was, and forgive me if I've told you this story before, but it's applicable. There was a, a family that moved into uh, the house next door. Uh, husband, wife, and daughter. The husband was a traveling doctor, and, and he would be gone for extended periods of time. And the wife, she, she spoke broken English. I uh, don't know where exactly she was from, but she was from outside of the country. Well, they, they always kind of kept to themselves anyway. Um, over the course of the few years that we were, uh, we were neighbors, uh, we'd wave and say hi and those things. But uh, eventually we realized that we hadn't seen the husband in a while. Okay, he's been gone for a bit. All right. And then we noticed we hadn't really seen her much. We know the car kept leaving and coming back, but she was hard to get a hold of. There was an instance where her dog got out, big dog, scary dog. Uh, and we went and, and rang the doorbell, and she had one of the ring cameras. So we knew she could see us, and we could see her in the house. She, hi, like, come get your dog. Uh, and she wouldn't come and answer the door. I'm like, man, I already thought these people were, were a little off. This is just weird. Another instance, a uh, package gets delivered to our house. Should have gone to theirs. Go ring the doorbell. Here's your package. She won't come to the door. Man, this is just odd. Another instance, uh, she's got something leaking on the outside of her house, and I'm trying to let her know, you got a water leak, this is going to be a problem. Ring the doorbell, did it several times, no answer. I know she's in there. This went on for months. Finally, I caught her outside as she was pulling out. I waved her down. I said, hey, just so you know, I need to show you this leak. This is, this is going to be a problem. She just looked at me. She said, Ever since my husband died, I've just not been able to keep up with all of the house and everything. I've just been overwhelmed. And I said, wait, what? Your husband died? She said, yeah, he died last year. What? I'm so sorry. I, I had no idea. She said, it's just been me and my daughter in this house, and we, we don't answer the door. We, we're just scared to be here by ourselves, and I can't sell the house, and I, my in-laws don't live nearby, and it just went on and on. I'm so, I am so sorry. I didn't know. And we offered, I said, anything you need. We literally are right here. Anything you need, let us know. But what, it, what I had done was I had come up with all these scenarios. She's just an oddball. She's just weird. She's just whatever. When she was suffering in her isolation and her trauma of losing her husband so suddenly, 
You just don't know what a person has been through and don't assume that you do. But, but we, we form opinions about people all of the time. We look at the news, we look at what people post on, online, and we make snapped judgments about how people look, act, or what they believe that is different than us. Friends, being a Jesus follower means that we are called to be salt and light to them. It means forgiving as we have been forgiven. It means not judging other people. And these things are hard. It is hard to live in an increasingly secular world while standing firm in your beliefs with grace and truth. And with that grace and truth, minus judgment. That's hard. But Jesus never said following him was going to be easy. It's easy to sit back and pass judgments on people. It's easy out of our own comfort or self-righteousness to look at somebody else and have an opinion. It's easy to dismiss entire groups of people because of their agenda. Yet we are called to lay down our hypocritical notion that we are somehow better than everybody else. I am a sinner saved by grace. You are a sinner saved by grace. The cross is the great leveler. So who are we to judge another person? Friends, people, pe people are a lot like me in, in trying to bake. It's a mess. People are a mess. Yet God does incredible things with messes. Can I get an amen? amen? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I thank you for each person who's gathered here today. I thank you for the messes that we are and the fact that you are already at work inside of our lives. God, help us acknowledge that in the same way that you are at work cleaning up our mess, that you are already at work or desire to be at work in the lives of every other person person who has walked the face of this earth to clean up their mess, to forgive their sins, and to bring them into your fold. God, may we give them the same grace that you show us as we join with them in becoming your people. Father, we pray all of this as we pray the prayer that your son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.